stolen cars, hidden agendas, and a princess in the crosshairs. This tale's got it all, and we've got the inside scoop for you. Picture this. Princess Anne, the powerhouse and only daughter of the late Queen Elizabeth II, suddenly finds herself in the middle of a heart-pounding situation when a joyous royal ride takes an unexpected turn. This is a story of resilience, courage, and the unwavering spirit of the brave princess and seven heroes as they clash against the sinister plot of one kidnapper. So get ready as we're delving deep into the layers of this astonishing narrative, uncovering the high-stakes drama that unfolded in the very heart of London. It's a real-life action movie, and Princess Anne is the undisputed star of the show. Picture this. It is a chilly evening on March 20th, 1974, and Princess Anne and Captain Phillips, just four months into their marriage, are returning from a charity event to their residence at Buckingham Palace. The clock strikes 8 p.m., and their chauffeur-driven maroon Austin Princess Van den Plaas, decked out with all the royal trimmings, cruises down the mall, a beautiful road connecting Trafalgar Square to Buckingham Palace. In the back seat of their royal ride, Princess Anne, Captain Phillips, and Anne's trusty lady-in-waiting are having a jolly good time. Meanwhile, Inspector James Wallace Beaton, the ever-watchful guardian from SO14, Scotland Yard's Special Operations Branch takes his place in the passenger seat, keeping a keen eye on the surroundings. Little does this royal entourage know at the time that their evening joyride is about to take an unexpected turn into a world of danger, putting their lives at risk. As their limousine glides along, a Ford Escort rudely cuts in, forcing the driver to slam the brakes just 200 yards from the majestic Buckingham Palace. The sudden jolt causes a stir among the occupants of the car, and their gazes turn to the daring driver of the Ford Escort. From the modest vehicle emerges a man who seems out of place against the grandeur of the royal surroundings. Ian Ball, an unemployed laborer with a wild beard and fiery red hair, steps out with an air of determination. Clutched in his hands are not one but two handguns, their cold metal reflecting the dark intent in his eyes, a dangerous scheme to kidnap the 23-year-old Princess Anne for a ransom of $2 million. With the determination burning in his eyes, Ian Ball charges towards the rear of the princess's limo. Inspector Beaton, thinking he might be an upset driver, bravely steps out to talk to him. As Beaton gets closer, he quickly realizes things are serious. Ian Ball, armed with a gun, points it at the inspector, showing he means business. From just six feet away, Ian Ball fires, hitting Inspector Beaton in the right shoulder. Despite being hurt, Inspector Beaton tries to shoot back at Ian Ball with his Walther PPK, but his wounded shoulder makes it tough. It seems luck isn't on his side either, because after firing once, his gun jams, leaving him defenseless. Ian Ball sees his chance and quickly turns to the back door behind the driver's seat, shaking it hard. He demands the door be opened immediately or threatens to shoot. Inside the car, Princess Anne and Captain Phillips struggle to keep the door shut, while Princess Anne's lady-in-waiting crawls out of the door on the passenger side. Seeing an opportunity, Beaton jumps back into the limo, placing himself between the couple and Ian Ball, who fires into the car. Beaton's hand deflects one bullet. However, Ball shoots him a third time, hitting him in the abdomen. Severely injured, Beaton falls out of the car and falls to the ground, gasping for breath. After Inspector Beaton's daring move, the next hero in line is chauffeur Alexander Callender, one of the Queen's drivers. Unfortunately, he gets shot in the chest and falls back into the car. Ball then turns his attention back to the princess, opens the back door, and grabs Anne's forearm while Philip holds onto her waist. He urges her to come out. However, true to her style, Her Royal Highness Anne refuses to leave the safety of her car. She boldly declares, not bloody likely, making it clear that she has no intention of going with Ball. She is determined to stay right where she is. When asked about the talk with the man, Princess Anne said, He said I had to go with him. I can't remember why. I said I didn't think I wanted to go very much. I was scrupulously police because I thought it was silly to be rude at that stage. We had a fairly low-key discussion about the fact that I wasn't going to go anywhere. And wouldn't it be much better if he just went away and we'd all forget about it? Which was wishful thinking. The princess continued, It did get slightly rougher at one stage when he shot the policeman. We managed to shut the door, he got the door back open. But in the process of getting the door back open, the back of my dress ripped, all the shoulders went, and that was his most dangerous moment. I lost my rag at that stage. He'd opened the door, he grabbed my arm and pulled. I wasn't going anywhere, put it this way. Anne went on to explain that she yelled, just go away and don't be such a silly man. Captain Phillips shared the whole situation, recalling how he felt trapped like a caged animal when the police officers showed up. He said it felt like the rescue was really close, yet so far, as the constables hesitated to move closer to the armed man near the princess. 
Police Constable Michael Hills, a mere 22 years old, is the first to arrive on the scene. The air is thick with tension as he patrols nearby, and the sounds of a struggle reach his ears. Assuming it's a routine car accident, he approaches Ian Ball and lightly touches his shoulder. The unexpected happens. Ball swiftly turns around, his eyes burning with rage and fear. In the blink of an eye, a shot echoes through the night, and Hills clutches his stomach in pain. The cold realization sets in. This is no ordinary encounter. As Hills collapses to the ground, the world around him blurs, yet he gathers every ounce of strength he has left to reach for his radio. The urgent call for help crackles through the airwaves, and the night continues to unfold like a suspenseful story. In the fading light of the evening, Ronald Russell, a company cleaning executive on his way home from work, notices the chaotic scene on the side of the road. He witnesses Ian Ball confronting Officer Hills and thinks he needs sorting. Standing tall at an imposing six feet four inches, the former boxer makes a spontaneous decision to take action against the shooter for harming a policeman. At the same time, another character enters the unfolding drama. Glenmore Martin, a chauffeur, strategically parks his car in front of the white Ford, blocking any potential escape route for Ball. Martin tries to distract the gunman, but when Ball aims his weapon at him, Martin shifts his focus to helping Officer Hills on the roadside. Meanwhile, Daily Mail journalist John Brian McConnell arrives at the scene. Recognizing the insignia on the limo, he realizes a member of the royal family is in danger. Don't be silly, old boy, McConnell says to Ball. Put the gun down. The plea falls on deaf ears, and in response, Ball shoots McConnell. The journalist crumples to the road, joining the ranks of the injured. With McConnell now down, Ball turns back to his struggle for Princess Anne. Seizing the opportunity, Ronald Russell approaches from behind and delivers a powerful punch to the back of Ball's head. The unexpected blow leaves Ball stunned, stumbling forward in confusion. While the former boxer distracts the gunman and reaches for the door handle on the opposite side of the back seat, she opens it and pushes her body backward out of the car. I thought that if I was out of the car that he might move, she said. She was right. As Ball runs around the car towards the princess, she jumps back in with Phillips, slamming the door shut. Ronald Russell then punches Ball in the face, an act that later earns him the prestigious George Medal from the late Queen, where she expresses gratitude, saying to him, the medal is from the Queen, but I want to thank you as Anne's mother. More police officers join in on the action, and Ball realizes that he is outnumbered and in serious trouble. He knows he needs to find a way to escape. Peter Edmonds, a temporary detective constable, hears Officer Hills's call regarding the attack. As he pulls up to the scene in his car, he sees a man take off with a gun through St. James Park. Edmonds chases Ball, throws his coat over Ball's head, tackles him, and makes an arrest. Authorities Later, learn that earlier that month, Ball had rented a home on a dead-end road in Hampshire, five miles away from Sandhurst Military Academy, also the home of Princess Anne and Captain Phillips. Ian Ball, aged 26 at the time of his arrest, was declared a victim of mental illness. He had rented the car under the name of John Williams. In his car, police find two pairs of handcuffs, Valium tranquilizers, and a ransom letter addressed to the Queen. Ball had also written a rambling note that criticized the royal family and demanded a $2 million ransom in $5 sterling notes. Ball proposed a grand scheme. The Queen should have the money stored in 20 unlocked suitcases and put on a plane destined for Switzerland. Queen Elizabeth II herself was required to appear on the plane to confirm the authenticity of her signatures on the needed paperwork. Ball's plan seemed audacious, to say the very least, but the one good thing that came from this ordeal was that it highlighted the need for improved security measures within the royal family. 